All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And it's Wednesday, January 24th. We are like 37 days away from week one of competition. And uh, uh, not to freak anybody out. <laughs> um, so the topic this evening will probably be quite a few awards folks on this call. So you may or may not be as stressed out as um, as robot builders. I will tell you just real quick before we get into the announcements and our um, presenters, make sure you look over the um, the details this year on submissions for the impact award to our changes. Um, the videos are optional, uh, but they have to be submitted at the time of your submission with a link. Uh, and then, at, so after submission date though, if you if you're like, oh, well, we'll make our video going into week one or going into our competition, they won't be shown. So just make sure whatever, if you are going to do a video that it's ready at time of, of impact award submission. Otherwise there won't be a video to, um, so you, if no more showing up with thumb drives or, uh, you know, DVDs or CDs or anything like that. Uh, so anyway, all right, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to give a couple of, um, uh, announcements like I normally do. And then we're going to get into our presentation. This will be fun tonight. This will be a good one. So hopefully everybody can see my screen and it says youth protection, but that's not true. That's not tonight. Um, <laughs> you can tell I just uh, I changed my slides. Uh, information. All right. So announcements. Uh, just a few things here. So uh, Dean's List Woody Flowers Award. Um, are those are do those windows close on February eighth? So we're about two weeks away. Um, at three p.m. Eastern, no late submissions. Uh, remember that uh, mentors submit for Dean's List, and only students uh, can submit uh, the Woody Flowers Award nominations. Uh, that means uh, mentors, Coach One or Coach Two, has to identify a student award submitter in the dashboard. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you need help with that. Uh, the first impact award window closes the 15th at 3 p.m. Uh, no late submissions there either. Now, they did change that a couple of years ago um, that a mentor or a student can um, hit submit on that. And that was primarily because there were students that um, uh, on the day that it was due might not have access uh, to the Internet or might be blocked by school or things like that. Anyway, the intent still, of course, is that the students do the, the bulk of the work on that on the submission is just that a mentor can literally um, like, you know, uh, submit the stuff. Uh, FRC teams this year, we're gonna be uh, having some more information out to you all here very soon. Uh, we're asking everybody to provide at least one volunteer at each district event they attend. The district championship has expanded to 38 teams from 32. Uh, the FRC manual has been updated to reflect that. That was in week one update. Registration fee for state will be due Monday, April 1st. If you think now, oh gosh, we're probably gonna be on spring break. During that time, please plan ahead, work with your school district or your office or community, pro whoever you work with to pay for things uh, so that you can be prepared for that. Of course, we won't know. Uh, you won't know anyway until, um, uh, sorry, I wanna make sure everybody's in, uh, You until the Saturday of, um, the district event in Washington that evening, uh, we'll have the final 38 uh, teams going to state listed there. Uh, first championship registration fee will be due Tuesday, April 9th. Um, that's a, a super hard date on that one. First, we'll actually remove your team from championship if not paid by that date. Uh, so again, if you think your school's going to be closed or things like that, work with your offices. Uh, our point of emphasis this year is gracious professionalism of everyone who attends our events, please take the time to teach your parents and community the importance of GP and that it's expected by all who attend events. I've got one more quick slide after this to kind of emphasize that. Hey, uh, teams, Washington District event has some openings. Um, typically, a third play is $1,000. We've cut that in half. Uh, if you're interested in attending Washington, reach out to either myself or Dan Leathers, because uh, at this point, um, you can't sign up for it in the dashboard. We have to actually place you there. Uh, and then also looking for a, um, a practice field. Um, I've got 
uh, some of anyway, the people who've told me that they have practice fields um, uh, listed on our website. I will drop uh, the link here. Uh, check that out. Those are uh, locations that have said, yeah, other folks can come on out and, and reach out to them. Uh, a little fundraising tip. Hey, and of course, this is actually one that uh, Red Alert has done. Uh, work with the local business, like a coffee shop, et cetera. Develop a product uh, to sell out of their shop. It, um, and uh, your team could get a portion of the sales. It's kind of a win-win type of fundraising tip. Um, the local coffee shop here in Greenwood that is close by to Center Grove has had uh, a coffee called Robot Rampage for, gosh, I think it's almost like eight or nine years now, maybe longer. It's scary it's to think 10 that. Years. <laughs> 10 years. 10 Robot years. Rampage. And it's, yeah, and it's been <laughs> one of their best sellers. Uh, and the team gets a cut of it. And um, and it's it's good for it's good for everybody. So, all right. And then just real quick on the announcement slides, the things related to our events, uh, rules E101, E102, and G201. Uh, when you're looking at the FRC manual, please go over those with your team. Also deep, dig a little bit deeper down there so that you understand some things about our events. Uh, uh, be kind, be a nice person. These are kind of the earliest, most important rules of first. Uh, also, some of the E101 rules are around some of the personal safety things at our events, uh, close toe shoes in the uh, field in the pits, safety glasses, things like that, hair up, um, you know, no drawstrings on shirts, things like that, just like you're in your shop. Uh, but then also um, things like no saving seats uh, at our events. So when you get into the gymnasiums, uh, you might be there first, but you, you can't just put down a million pom poms and uh, save your seats. And uh, and also things like no Wi-Fi hotspots and all that. So make sure you go over those. Uh, violating these rules can actually put your team in jeopardy uh, of not receiving awards. But now we're going to talk about how, like this transition, how you can position your team to win awards. Uh, with that, we uh, very graciously have uh, with us this evening um, uh, Rachel Miller and I believe Abby Fain, right, from Red Alert Robotics, FRC 1741, mm -hmm. Center Grove High School. Uh, rookie year was 2006 for Red Alert at Center Grove. Uh, they have three Dean's List finalists uh, out of that uh, team, 29 awards uh, yeah. since 2015. That's the second most uh, in Indiana. Um, they have seven chairman slash impact awards. Uh, that's in their total history and three engineering inspiration awards. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce you all to Rachel and Abby. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off. Rachel, I think you can drive and share screens and all that and take it away. Thanks for joining us, by the way. No problem. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as soon as my computer cooperates. Um, so hi and welcome. Chris already gave us a very um, nice introduction, but my name is Rachel Miller and I am the head operations mentor for Red Alert Robotics. Um, as the head operations mentor, I focus a lot on awards and basically um, things that don't typically have to do with the robot. Um, so a lot of outreach, award submission, uh, business, uh, graphic design and different things like that. And then I will let my student who's here with me introduce herself. <laughs> Um, I'm Abby Fain. I am a junior this year and I am the operations captain on the team. Um, so like what Mrs. Miller oversees, I oversee and um, work directly with a lot of the leads and students um, to make sure projects get done and get done to a high standard. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on things. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to pop in. I'm totally okay if you guys want to pause me in the middle of a slide or different things like that. Or if you want to send them in chat, that's okay too. I'll try to keep an eye on that as well as we kind of um, go through our slides. I will say a lot of the slides are very text heavy. I did that. So um, when we share this presentation with anyone who might not be on the call, or sometimes it's just easier to see the text on the screen for some people, as well. Um, so feel free to take screenshots or anything like that, and we'll make sure to share this presentation as well. <laughs> um, so Chris already gave some background about Red Alert Robotics, but um, the way we organize ourselves within Center Grove is we have been a team, um, an FRC team for going on 19 years now, and we promote team and robotics to all age levels. So Red Alert Robotics 
1741 is the hub um, of kind of the Center Grove Robotics Program. But then we have teams all the way down to preschool. Uh, we are starting teams in our developmental preschool this year. So we're very excited about that. Um, so the first thing I wanna go over is kind of what, what is the purpose of a judge? What is the judge doing there? Um, there's two different kind of categories judges fall into. There's typically one judge advisor who is leading the judges. Um, they typically have quite a bit of experience um, being a, a judge in the FRC community, and they are leading the group of judges. The judge advisor doesn't make any direct decisions. They are just helping guide the judges to make the decisions of the awards. And then you have your judges who are a wide variety of volunteers. Um, some of them have a lot of first experience. Some of them a little bit of first experience. Some of them, it's their first time at a robotics competition. So you get a wide variety with judges, but typically the judge advisor does a mix um, if, when they break out into pairs, which I'll talk about here in a little bit of experienced judges versus non-experienced judges and different things like that. Um, and then their main job is to interview and observe teams everywhere, everywhere at a competition. We typically think of judges at the pit and near the playing field, but judges are always watching. Uh, we tell our students all the time, like a judge can totally ask you a question in the restroom. Uh, we've had that happen on our team before or coming out of the restroom or different things like that. Um, they're always watching. Um, and then they decide as a large judge group what teams and students receive uh, the awards. Um, so this is kind of what a typical day or days, uh, because when you think of a district, it's actually two days, uh, okay. looks like for a judge. Um, typically, they are doing some type of training online before the event. Um, Typically that's through the first system. And then the judge advisor also might be communicating some training. Sometimes there might be a pre-training um, with the entire judge panel, different things like that. But there is some training before. Then they, just like us uh, teams, when we arrive, they arrive at the venue, they get settled down and do another short training, again, led by the judge advisor and get a tour of the event and kind of the lay of the land, if you will. Um, then they will break into judge groups, um, and this is for all awards. This isn't specifically. So we will have some judges go and do the impact award, which if you're not familiar with that process, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But And then the rest of the judges will break into groups of typically two to three judges and go start talking to teams. Now, I did this in here. It really depends on the event, but some judging starts before opening ceremonies. Um, you may have judges vis come visit you before opening ceremonies. So as a team, Red Alert, we try to be ready as soon as the doors open because we want to be ready for a judge whenever um, they come to our pit to talk to us. Um, they do attend opening ceremonies. So that's why we typically, especially in Indiana, we shut down the pits and we have all teams clear. Red Alert tries to hold that as well. And judges attend opening ceremonies. Um, and then after opening ceremonies, they kind of jump right back into it. Um, they talk to teams throughout the day. Um, it really depends how the judge advisor divides it up is what we have found. Sometimes um, they do it by team number. Sometimes they do it by categories of awards. It just, it's hard to say how exactly they do it because they don't show that process too much to teams, but you should be visited by at least two sets of judges at some point. Um, so again, that they're judge groups of two to three people. You should have a visit from two sets of judges. Um, then they'll kind of come back together as a judge group and start deliberations, start getting an idea of what teams fall into what categories. Then they do a second round of interviews. Um, and then I have another note here that most judge advisors will make sure every team gets to see judges during round two of interviews. Now, in our district format, this is typically happening the morning of the second day. Um, but 
again, it's kind of competition to competition exactly when you will see the judges. Um, but that's what we have kind of noticed and done. And then after they finish their round two, they will come back together as a judge group, do final deliberations and choose who the winners are and then do scripts. And then we'll attend closing ceremonies. So one of the most important things for when you're talking to judges and preparing for that process before competitions is to be very familiar with the award descriptions. So FRC, the first um, website has a really good page for the FRC awards. Um, that's been very helpful as um, we learn more about the awards. It has very helpful descriptions. It has guidelines. It tells you exactly what the award is looking for. So it's very important to be familiar with the awards that um, all the awards that the judges will be asking, but especially the awards that your team may um, be more geared towards. Um, it's very helpful to know what your team will be successful in because as judges ask questions, you can kind of like kind of lead them a certain way so that you're able to talk about your strong suits as a team. So there's four different award categories and all of these are broken down into what kinds of awards they are and um, just all the interesting all the information about the categories, but all of that is on the first website. Um, the four different categories are team attribute, submitted awards, machine creativity and innovation awards, and robot performance awards. So the last two are geared more towards the engineering side of the team. Um, and then the first two are geared more towards your outreach. Um, so those awards will be more uh, culture awards and like as it says team attributes, so specific individual parts of the way your team functions and is structured, whereas the last two will be specific to the season and your particular robot that year. Um, so there's a lot that judges are thinking about throughout the day, um, a lot of teams that they talk to. So it's really important that your um, like what you're talking about stands out. And it's also important to know what they're looking for. So for me, I focus mostly on the outreach and um, operation side of the team. So everything that's not robot related is something that I feel like I'm equipped to answer. So as soon as like judges start asking more technical or engineering related questions, that's when you know that they're kind of looking for a engineering related awards so a machining or creativity award or the robot performance awards and that's when it's important to have someone who's equipped to answer robot related questions um, that's when it's important to have and we'll talk about the robot awards more specifically later but that's when it's important to have your resources available for that but if judges are asking more about team attribute it can kind of be hard to tell which um which award they're going for. Um, so it's important to know, again, it's important to know the award descriptions as you hear the language that they're using when they're asking and the kind of questions that they keep asking and the things that they keep repeating, you'll kind of see what they're looking for from you. Um, again, it just helps to be familiar with the awards, but um, the team attribute awards, usually you can tell like with sustainability, they'll ask a lot about risk management, business plans, they'll be asking more about that. Whereas when they're asking about impact, it'll be more general outreach. What do you do in your community? Questions like that. And we tell our students all the time that it's okay to tell a judge, like if they're, if Abby's the only one in the pit, for example, and we don't, and they're asking some robot questions and she's not equipped to answer. It's okay to tell the judge of like, actually, I don't know. I can't answer that question very well for you. Could you come back at a different time? Or how about you talk to my engineering captain, Monis, or whatever, um, redirecting it to a different student is totally okay. The judges actually like to see that dynamic for any of the awards. They like to see the team dynamic of, okay, well, this student could answer, but they know who to go to for different things like that. Um, so like Abby mentioned, um, talking about the robot awards, so this is the machining creativity awards and different things like that. Robot performance is kind of that's all based on the field. So there's nothing really judging happening with that. Um, it's only truly based on your performance. But when talking about really any of the robot awards, whether it be the autonomous award or the um, the specific like creativity awards or excellence in engineering and different things like that, um, talking about going through the design process, I think is very important. Even if you don't have like the set steps you're going through throughout the season, you are going through the design process, even though you don't realize it. So talking to your students of like, okay, here was our idea. How did we start with that idea? How did we prototype with that idea? How did we 
um, find the problem with that prototype. How did we change that problem and fix it and then start the design process all over again? Um, if you're not familiar with the design, design process, there's some great YouTube videos and great visuals you can just look up on Google, um, but maybe showing that to your students would also be helpful, uh, talking them through these are the design process because the judges that are typically looking at the robot awards are at least familiar with the design process. They might not be familiar with FIRST Robotics, but typically they have some type of engineering background um, in one way or another. So they can go through that. I don't know if I mentioned, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but even if they're not an engineer, they're typically paired with an engineer in those groups of two to three judges. So typically you have a judge you're talking to who will understand that process. Um, this is a quote from an F, uh, a FRC judge um, that, who's on our team, who's judged several times. And he always appreciates when teams say it is talks about their failures, really. It is okay to talk about, well, we tried this design and it didn't work, so we went a completely different direction. Or we tried this design and tweaked it a little bit, and this is where we ended up with our final product, as long as you talk about the resolution. Um, so really coaching your students on that is very important. Um, also bringing prototypes um, from past iterations of your robot or very early prototypes is a great thing to do. I know it's sometimes really tight in the pit, so maybe choosing those prototypes sparingly, but bringing some examples, some physical examples are really great as well. Um, make sure to highlight what you're proud of. Going back to kind of jumping around to a few bullet points later of read, read, read the award descriptions. See what system you might be really proud of on your team what category does it fit into it? And really highlight that with your group of judges. Um, if a mechanism or if a system is pretty hidden in your robot and it might be really hard to show the judge how that works, that's where maybe bringing some past prototypes is good or having just a spare part to show the judges. I know we've done that in the past with um, things. We actually, in our for example, our 2020 robot, I remember that we had a very large sprocket that we made on our CNC here in our shop, and we made sure to make an extra because it was buried in the robot. You weren't going to be able to see it by the time they added the tube on top and then the chain around the sprocket. So we, pr we cut an extra one and had one to show the judges, and they really appreciated that. Um, and then I kind of already alluded to this, but don't assume the judges have common first knowledge. So when we're when we're talking with other people in the first community, we tend to use a lot of acronyms and shortened terms and different things like that. Make sure to use the full terms with the judges. So training your students to do that is something really important. I think um, um, a lot of people forget how to do. <laughs> So there's lots of advice I could give you, but here are some like really crucial tips and tricks when considering how to talk to judges, especially within the pits. Um, so having different members from different sides of your teams um, that are equipped to answer a variety of questions in the pits at the same time is very helpful because you never know if a judge is coming to talk about the robot or to talk about team attributes. Um, and so having people that are able to answer all those questions is really ideal. And then the people that maybe aren't equipped to answer those questions can inform other people to maybe come to the pits and help as well. Um, so our team always has people in the pits constantly. Though as long as the pits are open, we are in the pits. So even when our team is competing, we have people kind of rotate. Um, we always usually try and have one engineering person and one um, outreach operations awards person, someone like that in the pits at any time. Even if we are in a match, we usually try and like to have students in the pits as well. And if you do any award presentations like Dean's List or Impact where you're not like your team attribute people may not be in the pits. It's always nice to have someone else who is equipped to answer those questions. It's also nice, you know, your robot people, your drive team who are going to be in the pits all the time. It's nice for them to also be aware and informed on the different sides of the team because they will be in the pits all the time. So if they can answer team attribute questions or things like that when there aren't those kind of people in the pits, it's very helpful that they can like kind of step up and help. Um, something our team found very beneficial uh, these last few years is we have brought a cart to the pit every year. 
this cart has a bunch of drawers. So we use it for our passing on our buttons, but we also use it for a lot of visuals. Um, these visuals allow not only judges to see what we do, but our reminders for us students as we're talking to see what we need to talk about. It also allows us to go in a lot of detail um, visually with our most important outreach events. Um, judges really like to see like pictures and like the information, the statistics, they like to have that on hand and to be able to see it. Um, and so it's very helpful if you have like a cart or a bin or some organized system that's quick to just grab something out and hand it to a judge or to show them or to flip through. That's been very helpful and beneficial for our team these last few years as we've talked to judges in the pits. Um, the more organized it is, the more useful it will be um, because as students are talking and in the heat of the moment talking to judges, it can be hard to remember where things are. So keeping your cart or bin or whatever you use organized, um, but also having a variety of things from all the different outreach that you do and are proud of, or if you have a business plan showing that. If you have information about your robot, pictures of the robot at different stages or um, pictures of those mechanisms that may be embedded in the robot, those are also helpful to be able to show judges if space is limited in the pits for prototypes. In the cart she's talking about, we just actually bought a toolbox um, and it worked really well because it had all the drawers we needed and then we just labeled the drawers uh, with vinyl. So it was hopefully quick and easy to grab things and different things like that. And then we'll talk about the impact uh, presentation later, but we actually take that cart into the impact presentation as well. So all the information is there. Um, We've had it happen a few times. There is the risk of when you take the cart out to go to the impact presentation, the judges might show up, but it's still, I think, worth having that cart in the pits for most of the time when you're talking to judges in the pits and then also having it in the impact room. Mm -hmm. um, so just some more um, tips and tricks that we have found over the years that really help is we take every opportunity we can to practice, practice, practice with our students as a group of mentors. We use every opportunity we can to ask them questions. We have periodic design reviews during the uh, build season that we do with our captains, typically our captains and our leads. I have a picture um, in a few slides to show how you how we structure our team, um, but typically the captains and leads are the ones doing these design reviews, but we also have the um, underclassmen or maybe students who aren't in leadership positions start coming into these design reviews pretty on pretty early on in the season, so they start getting an understanding. Um, we start training our students as soon as they come onto the team. We do one-on-one -on -one interviews quite often, basically any chance we get. Um, we do it for our leadership positions on the team. We do it for Dean's List. Uh, we do it for our Dean's List tryouts. And then we also do it for, we also actually practice with whoever we end up nominating for the Dean's List award. We do big team interviews. Um, so sometimes we just get our entire team together. To give you an idea of our size of our team, we have about 45 students this year. Um, but sometimes we'll just ask everyone like at a beginning meeting some questions and different things like that and kind of classic classroom style, have them raise their hand and answer. Um, and then sometimes we have outside people come in. You kind of don't think of that, but having mock judges and you don't even have to call it mock judging, but having sponsors come in or school board people or your principal or teachers or having like a community open house and just talking to people that again, aren't familiar with the first community and first terms, um, practicing in that sense is really great, um, just as another form of practice. Um, some other tips and tricks that if you have a positive story or interaction about another team, share it with pit admin. Um, they will make sure to get that to a judge advisor. Um, if it happens at a competition or if it happened like before a competition, just sharing that with your pit admin, they'll make sure it gets to the judge advisor and that's always really helpful. Um, a key thing that I think a lot of teams aren't aware of, it's not a big issue, but I, I, I want teams to be aware of it, that judges should only be judging you on what you present at the competition. That is very clear in all of the judging process that they only can judge what is presented to them at the competition, what happens at that competition. So if a judge is saying, well, you did this last year or last competition, you did this, you need to make pit ad, you need to tell pit admin and they will talk to the judge advisor. You need to talk to the judge advisor and make that very clear because that is not what a judge should be doing. And it's, it's hard to do that, especially when we have like a solid group of volunteers 
um, that sometimes are judging from competition to competition and it, it, they might not even realize they're doing it and that's okay. So we also train our students that like if a judge brings that up, that to kind of redirect the conversation and then tell a mentor and we'll make sure to um, let the judge advisor know. Um, and then in our next slide, we'll show a key list of highlights about your team or robot that we specifically do with um, some of the awards. So yeah, if you look at this, um, these are uh, three pieces of paper that we actually taped onto the back of that toolbox that we talked about last year. Um, we taped it on because in the pits, when you're standing there, a lot of times, like the majority of the time you'll be in the pit, you're actually like not talking to judges. So for me, when I was in the pits, I would just look at this and reread it and reread it and reread it and reread it. Because not only is it the award descriptions telling me exactly what the judges are looking for, but it also is really helpful for us both when we wrote it and to reread it, um, what we need to talk about specifically that's in relation to that award. It's hard, especially with awards like impact and engineering inspiration, where there's a lot of overlap um, to kind of remember, especially when judges are asking questions, what you can kind of remember what they're looking for and also what relates to that. So having these papers was super helpful. Um, when talking to judges, we would glance down at them and just make sure that we we're kind of hitting the points that we wanted to hit, but obviously like don't read off of them. But um, just doing this for the awards that you think that your team is has a really strong program for and may be eligible for is a really good way for your students to kind of be aware and be uh, paying attention to the questions that judges are asking, as well as what to talk about. And it was also helpful for the people who aren't as familiar with the awards that were in the pit, specifically with our drive team and our robot people, who maybe weren't as familiar with all the outreach that we do. If there was a judge that asked a question to them about these awards, they had a resource to look at of what to talk about for what specific awards. So that's been really helpful for our team. Yeah, we've definitely had moments where like Abby or some, or whoever for the operation side has had to step away and like whoever's in the pit kind of has to buy time until they could get there. So these were really helpful. These are just the examples we have because we're clearly the operation side of the team, the non-engineering side, but we've also created these for the robot side. Um, so last year at state, we won the creativity, yeah, creativity award. And we actually had a sheet for the creativity award in our, um, on the back of our cart. And again, these are on the back of the cart so our students can see them in the pit but the judges can't necessarily see them not that the judges seeing them wouldn't be bad um but it's just helpful for the students so something that our team has found very valuable and that we would encourage other teams to do the same is to really incorporate and instill the core values um, in your members so our team has a very strong pipeline this is when i talked about it earlier preschool all the way through 12th grade. And so especially at a young age, talking about the value of the core values um, is very helpful. It builds character, but it also ends up being very beneficial in the later years for the more team attribute and submitted awards. Um, if students are familiar with these values, they're more likely to live them out, I guess. They're more likely to act on them, to pursue discovery and innovation. Um, I mean, the impact award is impact. So the more you have the core values embedded into your team, the more your team will be able to succeed in their outreach or their robot awards or whatever. It, it's been very helpful for our team as we instill it through our pipeline and also in our older years. And just to add on to that, we also have our mission and vision statement and other like key questions and key points that we make sure to remind our students of throughout the year that I think are really helpful. We have posters of our mission and vision statement and our inclusion statement hanging up in our shop. We have core values posters hanging up in various areas and different things like that. And even we try to incorporate the core values into like our outreach. So for example, our two summer camps that we host uh, we go over the core values every single day with all of our uh, K through fifth grade students um, and start core values, even if they're not a part of our pipeline of uh, teams. Um, we are doing that in our camps as well. Um, so like I mentioned before, this is kind of how we um, organize our team. And I think organizing your team and having one, a visual really helps um, judges because almost in any of the award categories, they'll ask, like, how do you organize yourself? So even when we're talking about the robot awards, they're like, okay, how did you incorporate the drivetrain into the scoring system and different things like that? So organizing your team and having a visual for that, I think is very helpful. This is our organization level. Um, we are a student-led team. So even though we have mentors, just like how 
um, first kind of designed it. Our mentors are working alongside our students, but our students are the ones leading. Um, so all of the red um, boxes at the top are our team captains. So we have one executive captain, an engineering and design captain who work very closely, um, an operations captain, which Abby mentioned, a MATS, which is um, an acronym, machine and training safety captain, and then a SPEC, strategy programming electronic controls captain. And then all the other colorful boxes are our group leads. So we don't we don't say sub team captain or anything like that. We, we have two different terms of we have a captain and then we have leads. Um, they're leads over various different areas. And I think it really helps by organizing your team in whatever way you do. This is just how we do it. And honestly, we tweak it from year to year to fit the needs of our team. Um, but having a lead or captain over each area really helps us streamline the process of how we want to succeed in all the different areas that you can work in in first. Do you want to talk about our business plan? Sure. <laughs> so um, every year we do a business plan and we also do like risk management. Um, we focus a lot on like our team sustainability. So our plans for our future and how we're going to get there um, and how we organize our funding. This all kind of factors into the sustainability award, if you're familiar with that award. Um, so we do a risk management plan, a business plan, um, SWAT and PEST surveys, which are both an um, acronyms mm -hmm. for um, different kinds of surveys where you ask students on the team and then also mentors um, different strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats for SWAT. And then PEST is more outside factors that factor into what could interfere with our team in the future. And these are all really helpful for planning how our team is going to be sustainable, um, how we're going to be able to continue our outreach, how we're going to be able to fund building a robot next year. Um, all of this is very important and it's also very helpful to have these on hand to give to and show judges in the pits because if they are asking about the sustainability award this is exactly what they're looking for they want to know things like this so being able to have this information for them is very helpful yeah so we specifically have a bit like she said kind of the separate documents of the business plan and then the risk management plan and we are willing to share these documents with whoever would like a copy of our documents we've had several teams kind of use them as a jumping point to make their own document. Um, they are important to the sustainability of board, but I would say any of the team attribute or submitted awards, business plan is now sustainability. Used to be called the entrepreneurship award, used to be a submitted award. Um, so several years ago, showing my age in the program, but anyways, um, having the business plan and risk management plan, yes, is very important to the sustainability award, but is also important to several of the other awards, like the impact award, for example. Um, they want to see how your team is organized and different things like that. Um, so it's very important having those initial documents. Um, if you want to see our documents to kind of get a starting point, we would love to share those with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then talking about, um, we're, we're going to talk about two more awards, um, specifically the impact and submitted awards, impact and dean list is what we're going to talk about next. Um, hopefully you're familiar with the impact award, formerly called the chairman's award. It is the most prestigious award in first, and it has nothing to do with the um, robot. It has to do with what impact uh, you are making on your community through the FIRST program. Um, so like Chris mentioned, we have won it seven times at the state or regional level, a few other times as well in the district level. Um, and there's a lot of different aspects to the impact award. So there's a couple things to take keep in mind when it comes to the impact award that it, it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> it takes a lot of time and effort to build up your team to be an impacting team because it, it is what embodies all of first and they they literally say it in the description it is the example of what a first team should be um so some key things that i always tell teams when they're starting out or they're trying to grow their outreach and different things like that to potentially be um in the running for the impact is ward is do outreach you are passionate about this is something i kind of background on me, I was a Red Alert student and I did FLL and then FRC within the Red Alert program, went to college, and then I came back to Red Alert. When I came back to Red Alert, I kind of did an overhaul of a lot of the different outreach we did because we had lost some passion in some projects. So I wanted us to be passionate about what we were doing in our community. So we only do 
outreach we are passionate about. So I asked our students all the time, like when they come to me with a outreach um, an idea or if someone else in the community, sometimes we have community members come ask us like, hey, can you do this outreach? I always ask, is it something we're passionate about? This Is this something we really want to do? Because you don't want to stretch yourself too thin by just doing outreach after outreach after outreach. It's not just numbers. The judges want to see your passion in those outreach events. So that's something I think is really important and sometimes teams lose sight of. Um, another key thing, if you're going down the impact award and really expanding your outreach is do define your community. Um, Sometimes it's literally your community. So for us, like our literal community would be Center Grove Community School Corporation, Greenwood, Indiana. But we think of our community larger than that. Um, so we think of our community of all the first teams that we have in our pipeline, all the first teams that we help, all the um, different outreach we do across the state and different things like that. So, and then after you've defined your community, what does your community need? What would be helpful in your community, kind of going along with what are you passionate about. Um, focus on spreading the impact of first. So again, you want you you like doing the outreach that has like big crazy numbers and different things like that, but you also want to make sure you're making an impact at that outreach event, for example. Um, so you really want to make sure, going back to the name of the word, make an impact. Um, and then you don't do outreach for the award. It just should naturally come along with it if you are doing what first is kind of outlined of like what a first team is it should naturally come with it um but with that there's a lot of different um things you submit with the impact award there's a lot of different essays and different things like that um so the first one is your large 10,000 character essay it is 10,000 characters with spaces um, you submit all of this on the award portal. We do not type it in the award portal. I would recommend that. Not recommend that at all. We type it in a Google document and different things like that. And it's just, it's hard because the awards portal signs you out after so long. Um, and then it's, it's just not a great award portal, if I'm honest. <laughs> Honestly, it hasn't changed. It looks the exact same from when I was a student back in 2009. So... Um, it's not the best. It So I wouldn't say type your essay in there. I would say type it in a separate document. So we do that. Uh, we start with a general theme. Sometimes the theme is just your team, but we try to choose something that kind of, again, going back to what you were passionate about um, to help guide your essay, because it's kind of daunting to say, okay, write an essay, 10,000 characters about what you do. It, it's daunting. So just like you would start a traditional English essay, we start with a theme. Um, so that's something we kind of think about year round, I would say. And then we make a decision around December um, of what our theme is going to be. And then we make an outline. Um, in the outline, we list, try to go back and list all of the outreach um, you want to mention. So hopefully you have a running document of some type or we go back and refer to our calendar and social media, and we use Slack as a team. Um, so we kind of refer back to those and make sure we got all of the outreach events that we got. Um, with the large essay, we add what we call fluff into it. That's kind of going back to your theme. You don't want to pick a too complicated of a theme um, where you have to spend like a lot of time explaining what the theme is. It should, again, kind of be a natural progression of a theme. Um, so we kind of keep fluff to a minimum and make it easy to read for the judges. Going back to the awards portal is there's no formatting in the awards portal. So even though it takes some characters for us, we make sure to separate paragraphs, have some headlines um, to different sections of the essay and different things like that. Because when they are printing it out from the awards portal for the judges to read, the impact award judges to read, um, it can be really hard to read if you just pasted a block of text in there. So we use the extra characters to format it nicely. Um, I should also say that with the impact, there are two or three judges focusing on the impact award, and that's a part of the impact award presentation and interview and different things like that. But also the other judges can have input into the impact um, award and we'll give uh, feedback and different things like that because this is an all-encompass award.
Um, then you have the executive summary questions. There are, there are 500 characters each. There's several different questions. I didn't list the questions here because you can find them on the first website. But with these, because they're 500 characters, again, with spaces, we put no fluff here. We get to the point of here's how we do whatever you ask. Um, and then another thing we've kind of done more in the past few years, I would say, is um, we don't try to repeat ourselves too much from question to question or from the large essay. So sometimes we make the decision of, okay, we're not going to put this in the large essay, but we're going to put it in the executive summary questions and in the presentation. So we try to get whatever we're saying uh, for outreach in at least two of the location, clearly for like some of the bigger events we're doing and the things that we think make a bigger impact, we put in all three or I guess four locations, but for some of the events, we're only saying it in one or two areas. Um, and then I really like what FIRST has done within the past few years. Um, they've always kind of had the catch-all uh, paragraph, as I call it, the 500 characters of like, is there anything else you want your judges to know? But then I think it was last year they started of, you can ask the judges a question. Um, take advantage of that. Come up with a question as your team of what you want to ask. The judges. Again, this is all outlined in the awards portal and on the first website, so I'm not going to go into too many details about that. Um, so the large essay and the executive summary, and then I'll kind of jump over the video. Chris already kind of talked about, um, you do new this year, you have to submit it with the large essay and the executive summary, um, but it's the same format of three minutes. It should not be used in the judging process. That has been something for a few years Sometimes we think it is, but again, we don't know. But, um, but so we try to make the s the not the essay the video um, as great as it it as great as it can be. Um, but it's not part of the judging process. You can it does say in the first manual you can show it in your presentation. I don't recommend it. I avoid all technical having to do with the impact presentation because technology just is as many strides as it has made in the past few years. Um, I don't trust it enough to go into the presentation and waste that time, that precious time potentially. So up to you, that is a team decision and what you do, but personally, red alert, we do not show the video in the presentation, but you do have that option. So going to the presentation, you have seven minutes worth of presentation and five minutes for question and answer. So 12 minutes total, you are in the room roughly. Um, Any time not used in your presentation, so say your presentation is only like five minutes, six minutes, goes to question and answer. So that is an advantage. You're in the room for 12 minutes, but you have the max of seven minutes for your presentation. Um, you shouldn't be interrupted for the presentation, but I'll kind of talk about the presentation a little more here in a moment. But two documents that I linked in here that I think are really important, the impact award definitions uh, first came out with these several years ago, and I think they are great and really helpful um, when writing these, because sometimes it's really hard to define like, what is starting? What is um, running? What is assisted? What is mentoring? And different things like that. So read, again, I've said this before, read, read, read um, these impact award definitions and they really help. And sometimes something you do, something um, we've really focused on this year is sometimes what you do with the community or with a team might fall into two of these categories, say that. So when you're like running events and different things like that, for example, we host and run a lot of our events. We're not just hosting it that it's in a team facility and we arranged it for it, but we're also running our events a lot of the time. So you really want to define that um, when you're doing the um, essays and different things like that. Sorry, my computer is being difficult. Maybe. <laughs> I'm working on it, I promise. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment. This is what we're talking about. Yeah, technology. this is what we're talking about technology. We do, we do not like technology <laughs> that much when it comes to red alert things. So there, just... there's a question. Um, yeah. 
I have a question about the presentation. Do you guys use PowerPoint or a physical presentation like a trifold board? We use physical. Um, so let me pull up my screen one more time. And I think that is in my next slide. Share. Um, so we don't do anything technology, like I mentioned. Um, when it comes to the presentation, we prefer a physical thing that our presenters are interacting with somehow, whether that be like them just flipping something or putting pictures on, or for example, in past years, we've had like them throw a ball or different things like that to make it kind of fun for the judges. Um, we do something physical and then we also try to leave something physical with um, the judges. So Going back one slide, this impact documentation form, again, you can find this with all the impact award resources on the website. That is, they started doing this several years ago and it's optional, but I think all teams should do it. Um, we create, you want to go grab the binder? I um, we create a very large binder based off this documentation form. Um, and it had, going back to the award definitions, it has you categorize different things. So we put things in like the news articles we might be in. We request letters from people from our different outreach events and different things like that. Um, and we leave that with the judges again as proof um, of what we do. Does that kind of answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so kind of talking a little bit more about the impact presentation, um, the way we do it on Red Alert is anyone can be on the impact team. We invite all of our students if they are interested to try out for the impact team. Uh, we try to have a good mix of male and female students and if possible, multiple people from different sides of the team. Again, just showing your team dynamic and different things like that. How we choose our impact team is we ask students, we open it up to anyone on the team, like I mentioned, we ask them to apply to try out. We set a tryout date. Then we take an old paragraph from an old presentation several years ago that like no one is familiar with. And we have, we ask them to memorize it, that that is what, because we have our students completely memorize the seven minute presentation that they're going into. Um, so we have them memorize an old paragraph and then they present the paragraph in front of a group of mentors and treat it like an actual real impact interview. Um, then those mentors will ask some typical questions you might see in the impact presentation room. And then we try different groups of students. So you can send three, students, up to three students in the impact presentation. Again, up to three. So if you only send two, that's fine. One, that's fine. But I would say try to send three. Um, we try different groups of the students together. So we might try like Abby, Ethan, and Lily. And then we might try like Abby, Ethan, and Sarah and different things like that just to see the dynamic. Because I think that's part of it too, is like how they feed off of each other and work with each other. Um, so then we set our impact team and then they kind of, they write the, uh, whoever is going to be on the impact team, we have them write the presentation. So it's in their voice. So we are typically deciding the impact presentation team pretty early on. Um, so they can write it and different things like that. Um, the other thing I will say with like the executive summaries and the large essay as a mentor, I don't do anything with the essays until they're ready for me. They write an initial large essay and then they come to me and says, okay, Mrs. Miller, we're ready for a first pass at it. And typically at that point, it's well over the character count. <laughs> um, so a lot of it's like cutting characters, but I'm also making sure they like got all the information in it and different things like that. So we really try to make that it is the students owning the essay and different things like that. Um, I already mentioned the impact documentation form. Abby was kind enough to go and grab our lovely binder. So this is the very large binder you will see. There's several things in the pocket that I need to add to this binder, but this is the form um, that we use and fill out. You can find it on the first website, but you basically label whatever the document is, you categorize it, um, you say what type of document it is, and then you give a numbering system. So hopefully it's easy for the judges to read. So we have different things in, like this is a news article printed out and different things like that. Um, let's try to find those. There's a thank you letter from a team. Um, there's a letter from the director of elementary special education in here for one of the projects we did within our school. Emails with um, other teams and teams across the world and different things like that. So this is, again, just kind of documentation 
to prove that we do what we say we do um, and different things like that. This form, I think, even though it's optional, I highly encourage teams to do it. Don't be intimidated by our binder. Uh, again, we're 19 years old, so we've been doing this a while. Um, we've also been submitting for the formally Chairman's Award, Impact Award for since our rookie year. So we've been working on this for quite some time. Um, so don't be intimidated and don't think, oh, I'm only going to have a few documents for my binder. Still turn it in. You got to start somewhere. Uh, we did not have this binder, I would say, even five years ago. Um, so different things like that. The other thing is, and you want to do this with all the different aspects is make it memorable. You want to you want to have fun. They want to see your passion and things like that. And that should, again, naturally come with all the steps you're taking. And I already alluded to this avoid technology. <laughs> I just, I don't, you're so limited on time and they make it very clear in the guidelines that if you have a technical problem, they can't give you extra time. Uh, they don't have to give you extra time. No, a lot of times the judges will be nice and like try to work with you, but they can't, they don't have to, and they can't give you extra time. So we just avoid it and use physical copies of things. I also have two things really quick. I, I was gone for a minute. So Mrs. Miller may have already said these things. But um, one thing that we try and do is we try and always have um, one or two extra people also familiar and trained on the presentation. So you can only send up to three students into the room. We always send three, but we usually have, an, again, a one or two other students who memorize usually the whole presentation and are familiar with all the content. These students are super crucial to this process because not only can we pretty much guarantee there will be a competition where one of our presenters isn't able to present, um, and that student can fill in their role. It's also super helpful for when those three people are in the room to have two other people who are familiar with the content in the pits. So that's something that our team has done that's been super awesome and it also gets a lot more people involved with this process. And then the other thing I was going to say, I don't remember. <laughs> but to, to what Abby was saying is having the like additional people trained. It's also a great way to train up your students. So you want to have when you're when you're doing all of these different levels, I would say, with any of the awards, and I would encourage anything you do on your team, not just with awards and different things like that, you want to have a good mix of like underclassmen and upperclassmen working on things. So when we have our additional uh, one or two presenters, we try to also make sure at least one of them is a younger student who can start learning the process of being a part of the impact team and what goes into the submission and different things like that. I did remember what I was going to say. <laughs> so um, I don't think this has happened while I've been on the team, but Mrs. Miller has said that it's happened before and it will happen if we do it. But if your presentation goes over seven minutes, they will cut you off. So it's like they're the, if you end your presentation early, you'll have longer for questions, but they won't let you go anywhere over seven minutes. Mm -hmm. So usually they'll just be like, okay, tell us when you're ready to start. And then they'll start the timer. And if you go over, they will stop you mid-sentence. So we always try and leave like 10 minutes or not 10 minutes, 10 seconds of buffer time, because when you're memorizing things, there's a lot of pauses where you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so just to have some buffer room, because the last thing you want is for you to get caught off because that will leave students flustered for the question portion. Yeah. Hey, just real quick. So it's about eight o'clock. I just want to make mm -hmm. sure. And I know there's a couple more slides left. Uh, most people, these calls uh, wrap up about now. So I just want to make sure if anybody has to go, if people want to stay. Uh, I know they've got more to share. Um, but also, if there's any questions at this point, if you'd like to ask a question, if you do have to hop off, um, still feel free to put the stuff in the chat. Um, also, uh, I'm willing to keep going, Rachel and Abby, if you're okay to wrap up those last couple slides? Yeah, we're willing okay, to. Okay, great, great. That And then what I'll do is I've been putting a lot of links in the chat and those links and, and some of the other resources that you all been sharing with us, I'll put in the YouTube description area okay. when it goes out on YouTube. So Sounds great. Uh, very good. All right. Thank you. So just a uh, couple more, I think just a couple more slides about the Dean's List. Yep. So awesome. just talking about the Dean's List Award, because as Chris mentioned, we've had ha we have had three Dean's List finalist students um, and different things like that. I'm not going to read too much about the criteria and different things like that, but there is a great guide online if you aren't familiar with that. Um, I've linked it here and we'll make sure to get the link out to people, but they do have a really good guide on what you do. But um, if you're not familiar with the Dean's List Award, it should be a sophomore or junior student who... Um, 
it really has a good sense of leadership and dedication of um, within the first program and different things like that. You can see in the criteria that they've um, demonstrated leadership and commitment to the first core values, going back to that, that we've talked earlier, um, they should be ideally involved in a lot of different aspects of the team. So even though they may be like on a mechanical team and different things like that, participating themselves in some community outreach and different things like that, but really a, a model for student and different things like that. Um, the way we do it on Red Alert is similar to how we do the impact award presentation is we actually have our students, well, I guess slightly different than the impact award. We have our students apply to be a Dean's List nominee. So we create a Google form and we ask them, why do you think you should be a Dean's List award nominee? And then if they apply, then we do an interview with, again, a panel of mentors, um, ask them questions uh, based off the Dean's List award description. We ask them questions and different things like that of why they think they are a uh, model Dean's List student and different things like that. So I think, yep, this is the essay prompt. So sometimes um, when we have the students apply, we modify these prompts um, and ask them these questions. And then based on our interviews, we choose um, who our nominee is or nominees. You can, you can just um, nominate one student if you want. You can nominate no students if you want, but you can nominate up to two students. Um, and then you have these essay prompts. The first five essay prompts are 800 characters, and then the last prompt is 500 characters. Um, so we really try to choose a student who is all encompass and does a lot of different things on the team. Um, they don't have to have a leadership position on our team. Um, they can be any student. Any student is open to apply or be nominated um, on the team. Um, and we kind of go from there after the interview process and different things like that. And then going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, practice, practice, practice with your Dean's List nominees. Um, we find that a lot of high school students, even as sophomores, they've never maybe had an interview experience. So that's why we try to give as many interview um, opportunities as we can. Um, so they get that experience and it's not just their first time going into the Dean's List award room. Um, with the Impact Award and the Dean's List Award, you are able to send one mentor in um, to take silent notes. The mentor is a silent observer. They can take notes on their phone or on their, um, on like writing down notes or different things like that, but you cannot record either um, presentation. And I do highly recommend sending a mentor in for both. I know it's optional, but it's optional now that we're back in person. But I I think it's good to have a mentor in there. So we, one, you see what's happening in the room. And two, you're able to give feedback to your students. You're, you say like, hey, this was really great. I loved how you highlighted this. Or you can say, okay, maybe next time let's do, let's make sure we highlight this and different things like that, both for the Impact and the Dean's List Award. And that's it. We really only had a few more slides, so just over on time. But if anyone has any questions, uh, we're open to answering any questions or any resources or questions about how we do things on Red Alert, we'd be happy to share. And it got really quiet. <laughs> Or it's been really quiet. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, well, it, definitely um, if you want to type your question in the chat, I've been monitoring the chat uh, or you can, um, we got a couple of thank yous. Um, uh, this is uh, really thorough information. Uh, Rachel, Abby, I want to thank you both uh, for taking the time this evening to go through this. I, I appreciate also that not only did you kind of cover the the how you all prep and get ready for these, but also kind of the judging process. That's uh, I think by starting with that, Rachel, what you really showed is it's it's just like with the robot game. It's so important to know the rules and and the challenges to build a robot for it. It's really important to know how the judging works and how the and the criteria of the awards before you show up and, and start talking about them. So yeah, I definitely, I definitely think again, read, read, read the award descriptions. That is, that is what 
um, is given to us as kind of guidelines and different things like that. And it, it, it's, it's pretty easy when you read the award descriptions to see what your team um, kind of falls into, what category they may fall into. Um, so I think that's very important for teams to do. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, everybody who attended this evening. Again, this will go out via uh, YouTube. Uh, probably sometime tomorrow, and I will have all these links on there, and then I'll be sending an email out um, uh, to let everyone know. So thank you.